The body of water that did this immense dam covers 700 acres. It is two and a half miles long and about three quarters of a mile wide and lies between two high hills. It is the old canal reservoir and was purchased from the Pennsylvania Railroad by the South Fork Hunting and Fishing Club in 1879. A high retaining wall had been built across the lower end of the basin and the water from a number of small streams soon filled up the depression. Around the edges of this lake, a number of Pittsburghers have built cottages where they spend the summer with their families. A large hotel is also erected and during the warm season accommodates a number of tourists. These cottages and hotel need not experience any ill effects from any flooding for they stand on elevated ground. If the water washed away the retaining wall, the rush would sweep directly away from these cottages and not injure them. When the hunting and fishing club bought the site of the old reservoir, a section of 150 feet had been washed out of the middle. This was rebuilt at an expense of $17,000, and the work was thought to be very strong. At the base, it was 380 feet thick and gradually tapered until at the top, it was about 35 feet thick. It was considered amply secure and such faith had the members of the club in its stability that the top of the dam was utilized as a driveway. It took two years to complete the work. Men began engaged from 79 to 81. While it was under process of construction, the residents of Johnstown expressed some fears as to the solidity of the work and requested that it be examined by experts. Made the thorough examination, they pronounced the structure perfectly safe, but suggested some precautionary measures as to the stopping of leaks that were faithfully carried out. Sides, South Fork, Muddy Run, Dunmire's Inlet, Robidaw's Inlet, and an unnamed brook were suddenly surcharged with water during the sudden rise, and this volume dashing into Connemaw Lake raised the water above the surface of the dam, washed away the top, coping, followed up this advantage by making a gap, and soon caused a yawning crevice that shot the water as from the mouth of a cannon. When once uncontrolled, it was probably only the question of a few moments to tear down the whole dam. South Fork, the village, is about two miles from the dam, but it lies high, and while the Connemaw River runs near it, a very remarkable volume of water would be required to reach the houses of the inhabitants. The channel of the Connemaw River is narrow, and the adjacent valley is nothing but a gorge. On the road to Connemaw, nine miles, the space is confined, and a body of water rushing along would sweep everything before it. First, Connemaw was struck. It is a town of 1,500 inhabitants, and the site is low. Two miles further, Johnstown is encountered, a city of 25,000 inhabitants, mostly mill workers employed in the iron, woolen, and wire mills of that place. The rush of water was so sudden, so terrible, and so deadly, that before the people knew anything was wrong, the wet avalanche was upon them, and rising to their housetops. The Pennsylvania Railroad tracks at this point are high, but they were brushed away like so many straws. The hills in the neighborhood are near and convenient as the low-lying country is not very extensive, but the only thing required was time to get to them, and that was totally lacking. Cambria City, lying a half mile outside of Johnstown, was also inundated. The South Fork Hunting and Fishing Club is an organization of 60 well-known businessmen of this city. E.J. Unger is president. E.A. Myers, secretary. It is supposed that the newly built part of the dam was that to take way. Why it should be weaker than the old part cannot be readily seen, as it was over 60 years younger than the latter. President Unger's efforts to keep the water from running over the wall, his thrilling description of the scene. Thursday night, when I went to bed, the water was no higher than usual. But it rained that night, and when I rose in the morning, the water was high. I went down to the dam, and soon found the water in the big body was rising an inch in every ten minutes. This alarmed me, and I hastened to get together a gang of Hungarians who were at work in the South Fork Waterworks. I set them to work digging a sluiceway at the worst end of the dam. I also got a team and began to throw up the ground on top of the dam to make it a little bit higher. We worked like heroes, but Civil Engineer Park rode up on horseback from South Park. I told him to run his horse to South Fork and notify the people, besides telegraphing to Johnstown. Away he flew, and we kept working away. The water slowly crept up on us, and at 12 o'clock it began to break over the ridge. We had made with a plow. At 1.15 I gave it up and went to the house. I could not stay, and soon the crash came. It was 1.45 o'clock when the whole massive wall shot outward. The water dashed out in a solid and massive column. In a second, George Fisher's house and stable were rolling and tumbling down the river. 
A second more, and George Lamb's house was caught. Then, in a jiffy, the iron bridge that spans the stream went like a bridge of straw. Oh, it seemed to me as if all the destructive elements of the Creator had been turned loose at once in that awful current of water. In less than two hours, Connemaw Lake was dry, and its fearful burden of water was speeding on toward its thousand victims in the cities below. The tidal wave struck Bolivar just after dark, and in five minutes the Kamenal rose from six to forty feet, and the water spread over the whole country. Soon, houses began floating down, and clinging to debris were men, women, and children shrieking for aid. A large number of citizens at once gathered on the county bridge, and they were reinforced by a number from Garfield, a town on the opposite side of the river. They brought a number of ropes, and these were thrown over into the boiling waters as persons drifted by in efforts to save some poor beings. For a half hour, all efforts were fruitless, until at last, when the rescuers were about giving up all hope, a little boy astride of a shingle roof managed to catch hold of one of the ropes. He caught it under his left arm and was thrown violently against an abutment, but managed to keep hold and was successfully pulled onto the bridge amid the cheers of the onlookers. His name is Hessler, and his rescuer was a train hand named Carney. His story is as follows. With my father, I was spending the day at my grandfather's house in Cambria City. Shortly after five o'clock, there was a noise of roaring waters and screams of people. We looked out the door and saw people running. My father told me to never mind as the waters would not rise further. But soon we saw houses being swept away and then ran up to the floors above. The house was three stories and we were at last forced to the top one. In my fright, I jumped on the bed. It was an old fashioned one with heavy posts. The water kept rising and my bed was soon afloat. Gradually it was lifted up, the air in the room blew close and the house was moving. Still the bed kept rising and pressing the ceiling. At last the post pushed the plaster. It yielded and a section of the roof gave. Then, suddenly, I found myself on the roof and was being carried downstream. After a little, this roof commenced to part and I was afraid I was going to be drowned. But just then, another house with a shingle roof floated by and I managed to crawl on it. I floated down until nearly dead with cold when I was rescued. After I was freed from the house, I did not see my father. My grandfather was on a tree, but he must have been drowned as the waters were rising fast. The scenes were terrible. Live bodies and corpses were floating down with me. I would see a person shriek and then disappear. Along the line were people who were trying to save us, but they could do nothing and only a few were caught. A young man with two women was seen coming down the river on a section of flooring. At the upper bridge, a rope was thrown down to them. This they all failed to catch. Between the two bridges, he was noticed to point toward the elder woman who, it is supposed, was his mother. He was then seen to instruct the woman how to catch the rope, which was being lowered from the other bridge. Down came the raft with a rush. The brave man stood with his arms around the two women. As they swept under the bridge, he reached up and seized the rope. He was jerked violently away from his two charges, who failed to get a hold on the rope. Seeing that they would not be rescued, he dropped the rope and fell back on the raft, which floated on down the river. The current washed the frail craft in toward the bank. The young man was enabled to seize hold of a branch of a tree. He aided the two women to get up into the branches and held on with his hands and rested his feet on a pile of driftwood. A piece of floating debris struck the drift, sweeping it away. The man hung with his body immersed in the water. A pile of drift soon collected and he was enabled to get another insecure footing. Up the river there was a sudden crash, and a section of the bridge dropped. Harry Fisher, a telegraph operator who was at Bolivar when the first rush began, says, We knew nothing of the disaster until we noticed the river slowly rising, and then were rapidly. News then reached us from Johnstown that the dam at South Fork had burst. Within three hours, the water in the river rose 20 feet. Shortly before six o'clock, Ruins of houses, beds, household utensils, barrels, and kegs came floating past the bridges. At eight o'clock, the water was in six feet of the roadbed of the bridge. The wreck floated past without stopping for at least two hours. Then it began to lessen, and night coming suddenly upon us, we could see no more. The wreckage was floating by for a long time before the first living person passed. Fifteen people that I saw were carried down by the river. One of these, a boy, was saved, 
and three of them were drowned just directly below the town. It was an awful sight, and one that I will not soon forget. Hundreds of animals lost their lives. The bodies of horses, dogs, and chickens floated past. E. H. McHugh, who lives in a house near the demolished bridge, obtained another view of the break about half a mile below the dam. The grand rush of waters was simply indescribable, said he. The mighty roar, the furious bellowing, the horrible appearance of this advancing wave as it came rolling and pitching onward, shall never forget. George S. Lamb had a horse near one of the approaches to the bridge. He hastily cleared his wife and children of the way, but could not save a single article of furniture, for the whole house was bundled out of sight the next moment. George C. Fisher is another person who owned a house and family on a very small salary. He lived nearer the dam than Lamb, but got out quite promptly when the first sound of the broken dam was heard. The release began at 2 o'clock p.m. and lasted until after 4. N. B. Henry engineer of the second section of express train number eight, which runs between Pittsburgh and Altoona, was at Connemaw when the great flood came sweeping down the valley. He was able to escape to a place of safety. His was the only train that was not injured, even though it was in the midst of the great wave. The second section of number eight, on which I was, is due at Johnstown about 10.15 in the morning. We arrived there safely and were told to follow the first section. When we arrived at Connema, the first section and the mail were there. Washouts further up the mountain prevented our going on, so we could do nothing but sit around and discuss the situation. The creek at Connema was swollen high, almost overflowing its banks. The heavens were pouring rain, but this did not prevent nearly all the inhabitants of the town from gathering along its banks. They watched the waters go dashing by and wondered among themselves whether the creek would get much higher. But a few inches more, and it would overflow its banks. There seemed to be a strange feeling of uneasiness in the breasts of the people. They seemed to fear something awful was going to happen. These suspicions were strengthened by the fact that warning had come down the valley for the people to be on the lookout. The rains had swollen everything to the bursting point. The day passed off slowly, however. Noon came and went, and still nothing happened. We could not proceed, nor could we go back, as the tracks about a mile below Commonall had just been washed away, so there was nothing for us to do but wait and see what would come next. Sometime after three o'clock on Friday afternoon, I went into the train dispatcher's office to find out the latest news. I had not been there long until I heard a fierce whistling from an engine away up the mountains. I felt that something was coming. Rushing outside, I found dozens of others standing around. They appeared helpless. Fear had blanched every cheek. The loud and continued whistling had made everyone feel that something serious was going to happen. In a few minutes, in a few minutes, I could hear a train rattling down the mountain. About 500 yards above Connemaw, Con the tracks make a slight curve. We could not see beyond this. The suspense was something awful. We did not know what was coming, but no one could get rid of the thought that something was wrong at the dam. Our suspense was not very long, however. Nearer and nearer, we could hear the train coming, like thundering sound accompanying it, making everyone's heart stand still. There seemed to be something behind it, as there was a dull, rumbling sound which I knew did not come from trains. Nearer and nearer it came. A moment more, and it would reach the curve. The next instant, there burst upon our eyes a sight that made every heart stand still. Rushing around the curve, snorting and tearing along like a fiery, untamed steed, came an engine and several gravel cars. The train appeared to be putting forth every effort to go faster. Nearer it came, belching forth smoke and whistling long and loud. But the most terrible sight was to follow. Scarce twenty feet behind came surging along a mad body of water, fully fifty feet high. Like the train, it too seemed pulling forth every effort to push along faster. For an instant, the people seemed paralyzed with horror. They but in a moment, they realized that a second's delay meant death to them. With one accord, they rushed to the highlands a few hundred feet away. Most of them succeeded in reaching the highlands, and most of them were accordingly saved. I bethought myself of the passengers in my train. You must remember the second section of number eight had three sleepers. In these three cars, there were about 30 people. Through the train, I rushed, crying to the people to save themselves. Here, a scene of the wildest confusion followed. Ladies and children shrieked, and strong men's cheeks were blanched. 
I succeeded in helping some ladies and children of the train. The track was about seven feet higher than the surrounding country. I helped the ladies down the bank and stayed until the water began running in my shoes. Then I caught up two children and ran for my life. Thank God I was quicker than the flood. I deposited my load in safety on the highland just as the flood swept past our train. For nearly an hour, I and the horrified spectators stood watching the mad flood go rushing by. The waters did not seem to flow along. They appeared rather to be rolling over and over as if the last could not wait on the first. The water seemed full of debris. When the flood caught Connemaw, it dashed against the little town with a mighty crash. The water did not lift the houses up and carry them off. Instead, it crushed them one against the other and broke them up like so many eggshells. When the flood passed onward down the valley, I went over to my train. It had been moved back about 20 yards, but it was not damaged. About 15 persons had remained in the train and they were safe. Of the three trains, ours was the luckiest. The engines of both the others had been swept off the tracks and one or two cars in each train had met the same fate. You may judge the force of the flood when it swept away the entire roundhouse in which were some 35 engines, many of them weighing 115,000 pounds. Some of the biggest engines were rolled a mile and more down the river. Mr. G. B. Hartley of Philadelphia, one of the five out of 55 guests of the Holbrook Hotel who survived the terrible flood at Johnstown. When the great rush of the waters struck Johnstown, I was sitting in the parlors of the Holbrook House, conversing with Miss Richards, M. Butler of the Cambria Iron Company, and Elmer Brinker. It was about 20 minutes to five o'clock in the afternoon. We were, I think, discussing the flood, for the streets of the town were three feet underwater. Suddenly, we were startled to hear several loud shouts on the streets. These cries were accompanied by a loud, crashing noise. At the first sound, we all rushed from the room, panic-stricken. Why it was I do not know, but we ran for the stairs. Mr. Butler took Miss Richard's hand. She called to me, and I took hold of her other hand. Then we started up the stairs. Mr. Brinker did not go with us, but instead ran downstairs where his brother had an office. The scene in the hotel is beyond imagination or description. Chambermaids ran screaming through the halls, beating their hands together and uttering wild cries to heaven for safety. Frightened guests rushed about not knowing what to do, nor what was coming. Upstairs we kept. Somewhere, I do not know when or how it was, I lost my hold of Miss Richard's hand. I really cannot tell what I did. I was so excited. I still rushed up the stairs and thought Miss Richards and Mr. Butler were just behind me. And I had reached the top flight of the stairs and was just between the third and fourth floors when a terrific crash came. Instantly, I was pinned by broken boards and debris of different kinds. The next moment, I felt the water surging up. Up, up it came, and before I knew anything, it had risen above my head. I knew it went higher than my head because I felt it. The water must have passed like a flash. I am certain it did, else I would not have come out alive. After the shock was over, I could see that the entire roof of the hotel had been carried off. Catching hold of something, I didn't know what, I managed to pull myself up onto the roof. The roof had slid off and lay across the street. On the roof, I had the chance to observe my surroundings. A feeling of deep gratitude to heaven rose within my breast when I saw the desolation scattered around me and the thought of the narrow escape I had from death. Down on the extreme edge of the roof, I espied the proprietor of the hotel, Mr. Benford. He was nearly exhausted, and it required every effort for him to hold to the roof. Cautiously advancing, I managed to creep down to where he was holding. I tried to pull him up, but found I was utterly powerless. Mr. Benford was nearly as weak as myself and could do very little toward helping himself. We did not give up, however, and in a few minutes, by dint of struggling and putting forth every bit of strength we had, Mr. Benforth managed to crawl up on the roof. We soon discovered that we were not the only occupants of this place of refuge. Crouching and shivering on another part of the roof were two girls, one a chambermaid of the hotel and the other a clerk in a store that was next to it. The latter was in a pitiable plight. Poor thing, her arm had been torn from its socket. I took off my overcoat and gave it to her. Mr. Benford did the same thing for the other, for it was quite chilly. While we were on the roof, I heard a neighboring clock ring out the hour of five. We did not retain our position long because the walls of the Holbert Hotel were constantly settling. Accordingly, we went over to the roof of the Fritz house. There, we stayed until 11 o'clock. Though we feared it would fall, so we climbed out 
on the piles of rubbish and made our way to a confectionery shop on an adjoining street. In this place, we stayed all night. When we got there, we saw a distressing sight. A young man was nursing his mother, who had had her scalp completely torn off. He asked me to hold her head until he could make a bandage. He tore a thick strip of cloth and placed it round her head. The blood saturated it before it was well on. By this time, I was nearly numb from cold. My overcoat I had given away, and my experience in the hotel had helped to deplete my wardrobe. I was a sorry sight indeed. My pants resembled swimming tights, while my coat was torn to shreds. An ugly gash on my head and innumerable cuts and bruises all over my body covered me with blood. When daylight came, I left the place and went out in search of help. Out in the street, I was confronted with the most desolate and heartrending scenes. The thriving little city of but a day ago was now nothing but huge piles of demolished houses, gathered in some places 40 feet high. Oh, it was an awe-inspiring sight. Men who were entire strangers rushed to each other and with streaming eyes embraced and kissed like children. The survivors in many instances acted as if they were in a delirium. I saw one man leading another who was blind. The latter presented a shocking appearance. His whole face had been crushed in and was covered with blood. I finally got to a place where they were running a raft to the higher parts of the town. It consisted of but four or five boards hastily stuck together. There were three already on it, and they wanted to put me off, but I knew it would hold one more, and so I made them take me. I see it is said that the people of Johnstown were warned that the dam was in a dangerous condition. Well, let me say no such warning had been given to the people at the Holbert Hotel. And Dr. Henry H. Phillips of the East End. He is the only one known to be saved out of a household of 13, among whom was his feeble old mother and other dear and dear friends. Dr. Phillips had gone to Johnstown to bring his mother, who was an invalid, to his home in the East End. And the flood began to come, and during the afternoon of Friday, the family retreated to the upper floors of the house for safety. The water was a foot deep on the first floor, and the family were congratulating themselves that they were so comfortably fixed in the upper story when Dr. Phillips heard an ominous roaring up towards the Cambria Ironworks. Without a thought of the awful truth, he stepped out upon the portis of the house. A wall of water and wreckage loomed up before him like a roaring cloud. Before he could turn back or cry out, he saw a house that rode the flood like a chip come between him and his vision of the window. Then all was dark, and the cold water seemed to wrap him up in a soft blanket and toss him to a housetop 300 yards from where that of his mother had stood. Gathering his shattered wits together, the doctor saw he was floating about in the midst of a black pool. Dark objects were moving all about him, and although there was some light, he could not recognize any of the surroundings. For seventeen hours he drifted about on the wreckage where fate had tossed him. Then rescuers came, and he was taken to safe quarters. A long search has so far failed to elicit any tidings of the twelve persons in the Phillips house. Shortly after eleven o'clock last night, word came to the West Penn Railroad offices that Holocaust had added its horrors to those of the flood at Johnstown. Houses and other debris which had been piling up like a mountain against the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge between Cambria and Johnstown caught fire from an overturned stove in a house near the center of the pile. Although the water was seething all around the flames had plenty of material to play upon. In a short time, there was a ridge of fire extending across the turbulent river for almost three quarters of a mile in which an inestimable number of human beings must have lost their lives. In the early stages of the flood, the debris had so piled against the railroad bridge that the water was turned aside into the yards of the Cambria Irons Company. A channel of outlet was afforded by the Baltimore and Ohio tracks, and the hope was held out that the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge would be spared. But the breaking out of the fire sealed its doom. The progress of the flames was stayed only by the absence of any more flammable material above water. It was reported about 11 o'clock that there were very few houses left above water in Johnstown, but that was worse than the railroad officials, filled with horror as they were, could credit. As for the bursted dam, it is a sight in itself. At a great distance, the break in the apparent bank of mud does not look very great, but a close inspection reveals the true state of the case. The open section is probably 100 feet in length, and the sides of the cut are remarkably smooth. Nothing like it was ever seen in this country, where long rows of dwelling houses and business blocks stood 48 hours ago, 
ruin, and desolation now reign supreme. Probably 1,500 houses have been swept from the face of the earth as completely as if they had never been erected. Main Street, from end to end, is piled 15 and 20 feet high with debris, and in some instances, it is as high as the roofs of the houses. This great mass of wreckage fills the street from curb to curb and frequently has crushed the fronts of buildings in and filled the space with reminders of the terrible calamity. From the woolen mill above the island to the bridge, a distance of probably two miles, a strip of territory nearly a half mile in width has been swept clean. Not a stick of timber or one brick on top of another being left to tell the story. It is the most complete wreck that imagination could portray. All day long, men, women, and children were plodding about the desolate waste, trying in vain to locate the boundaries of their former homes. Nothing but a wide expanse of mud, ornamented here and there with heaps of driftwood, remained, however, for their contemplation. It is perfectly safe to say every house in the city, not located well up on the hillsides, was either swept completely away or wrecked so badly, rebuilding will be absolutely necessary. These losses, however, are nothing compared to the frightful sacrifice of precious human lives to be seen on every hand. During all this Sunday, Johnstown has been drenched with the tears of stricken mortals and the air is filled with much sobs and sighs that came from the breaking hearts. There are scenes enacted here every hour and every minute that affect all beholders profoundly. When brave men die in battle for country, or for principle, their loss can be reconciled to the stern destinies of life. When homes are torn asunder in an instant, and the loved one hurled from the arms of loving and devoted mothers, there is an element of sadness connected with the tragedies that touch every heart. An utterly wretched woman named Mrs. Finn stood by a muddy pool of water, trying to find some trace of a once happy home. She was half crazed with grief, and her eyes were red and swollen. As the rider stepped to her side, she raised her pale and haggard face and remarked, They're all gone. Oh God, be merciful to them. My husband and my seven dear little children have been swept down with the flood, and I am left alone. We were driven by the raging flood into the garret, but the water followed us there. Inch by inch it kept rising until our heads were crushing against the roof. It was death to remain, so I raised a window and one by one placed my darlings on some driftwood, trusting to the great creator. As I liberated the last one, my sweet little boy, he looked at me and said, Mama, you always told me the Lord would care for me. Will he look after me now? I saw him drift away with his loving face turned toward me and with a prayer on my lips for his deliverance, he passed from sight forever. The next moment, the roof crashed in and I floated outside to be rescued 15 hours later from the roof of a house in Kernsville. If I could only find one of my darlings, I could bow to the will of God, but they are all gone. I have lost everything on earth now, but my life. A handsome woman with hair as black as a raven's wing walked through the depot where a dozen or more bodies were awaiting burial. Passing from one to another, she finally lifted the paper covering the face of a woman, young and with traces of beauty showing through the stains of muddy water. With a cry of anguish, she reeled backwards to be caught by a ragged man who chanced to be passing. In a moment or so, she had calmed herself sufficiently to take one more look at the features of her dead. She looked, gazing at the unfortunate as if dumb. Finally, turning away with a, another wild burst of grief, she said, and her beautiful hair all matted, and her sweet face so stained and bruised with mud and water. The dead woman was the daughter of the mourner. The body was placed in the coffin a few minutes later and sent away to its narrow house. The loss of life is simply dreadful. The most conservative people declare that the number will, will reach 5,000. The streets have been full of men carrying bodies to various places where they await identification since morning, and the work has only just begun. Every hour or so, the forces of men working on the various heaps of debris find numbers of bodies buried in the wreckage. It is believed that when the flames are extinguished in the wreckage at the bridge, and the same is removed, hundreds and hundreds of victims will be discovered. In fact, this seems certain. 
as dozens of bodies have already been found on the outskirts of the huge mass of broken timbers.